Revelation 15. Last time we were together, we looked at Revelation chapter 14 and 15. And we, re we read about that this reaping that is going to happen at the end of the age. Remember chapter 14 stood out kind of differently. It, it was almost like a reader's digest or a, a snapshot of a picture of the end of the age. And we saw that this reaping is going to happen. Chapter 14, it says in, yeah, back in chapter 14, verse 15, this angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle that and reap for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. And then down in 19, there was another angel. So an angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vines of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trotted outside the city and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridle for a distance of 200 miles. And then in chapter 15, we were introduced to the final judgment, what is called the bull judgment. Chapter 15, verse 1, John writes, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And so these are called the bull judgments. And then John saw these victorious ones who through the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, they overcame the beast and they sang the song of Moses. Verse two, it says, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God and they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Righteous acts this could be translated judgments. And it's his judgments that are righteous acts against unrighteousness. On Wednesday nights, we're currently studying through the book of Proverbs. And we, this last Wednesday night, we looked at uh, what Solomon describes as the fool and the things that, um, that the fool is involved in. And David in the Psalms had said that the fool is the one that says that there is no God. And this is Psalms chapter 10. I have this for the overhead. Psalms 10 verse 4 said, The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. That's God. All his thoughts are, there is no God. And then it goes on, Psalms 10 verse 6. He says, He says to himself, I will not be moved. Throughout all generations, I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in lurking places of the villages. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. And then David writes, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. God does not forget the afflicted. God remembers the afflicted ones. Remember the martyrs that were under the altar in Revelation uh, chapter 6, I think it was. And it talked about, he told them that they would just need to wait a little bit longer. And so what we're seeing here is God having his righteous judgments. He says, uh, chapter 15, verse 5, After these things I looked in the temple of the tabernacle, the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. 
And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Chapter 16, verse 1, And then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Father God, as we commit ourselves now to the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord, according to the promise in your word, would you bless us? Lord, would you give us discernment and understanding? Some of these things are just difficult to understand. It's difficult, Lord, for me to fully comprehend. We thank you, according to the promise of your word, that you are good and that you are righteous, and that you do not forget the afflicted. God, we pray for the nation Israel right now. Lord, in this conflict that is going on there. God, Lord, we ask for you to be victorious. Lord, we ask for you to have a favorable result, that you would protect the innocent, that you would be with Israel. Give us wisdom, understanding how we may pray for them and support them. And we do pray for peace. We ask for peace to be in the land. Bless us now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Seven angels, seven bulls, wrath to be, it's God's wrath to be distributed upon the earth. Notice at the end of chapter 15, it was the smoke of God's glory and of God's power that filled the temple. This is the now the third woe that we were told in chapter 11 was coming. So far, we have seen the seven seals in chapter 6. And every time one of those seals were broken, remember, there were just waves of difficulty that came upon the earth. And then there were the seven trumpets we read in chapters 8 and 9. And at the sound of each trumpet, there was more difficulty that came on the earth. Now it is the seven bowls. And each one of these seals, trumpets, bowls, are significant distribution of God's judgment on a Christ-rejecting world. And we read here in chapter 16 that these, God's judgments are right and true. Look at chapter 16, verse 7. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God and Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. You know, like I said, sometimes it's, it's hard for us to understand God's judgments. And we look at the things of the world and we, and we, from the best you know way we can, we try to have understanding or comprehension of what is going on or why things have happened the way that they are or or why has God allowed this or that sort of thing and and the truth is the scripture tells us that his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways this is isaiah fifty five verse eight God writes, "For my thoughts are not your thoughts." nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so by faith, by faith, we trust that God's judgments are righteous and true. And by faith, it's the same thing, that we trust in God's promises found in God's word of his grace and his mercy that are available for whosoever would believe on Jesus. Scripture says that they shall not perish but have everlasting life. And if you reject Jesus, then you're rejecting God's mercy, God's grace. And this is the group that we are seeing in Revelation in this time. They have rejected God. They have rejected God's Son. And so these judgments are coming upon them. So again, verse 1, this loud voice, chapter 16, verse 1, from the temple. And you go out, pour out on earth these seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel, verse 2, went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Chapter 15 told us that no one else is in the temple but God. So this is God who says to the angels, go, pour out the bowls. And as they're poured out, they're poured out onto, 
At the end of verse 2, those who had taken the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Remember that we have learned that this mark had to do with identity. It had to do with allegiance. It had to do with worship. And they identify with the beast and his system. And they worship him. And the people pledge their allegiance to him. And we're told if the, if the people don't, then they're cut off from the economical system. If they don't, they are persecuted and possibly have their heads cut off. It was a temporal persecution. But if they do take the mark, if people do take the mark, the Bible says that they're cut off from God's mercies. Look back at chapter 14. Chapter 14. Verse 9. So the mark of the beast was introduced in chapter 13. And then more information was given to us in chapter 14. 14 verse 9. Then another angel, a third one, followed him, saying with loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Remember, as we unpacked that and we looked at that, we saw that it was a temporal versus eternal thing. And so if you don't take the mark during that time of tribulation, there's a temporal persecution, a temporal difficulty. Maybe your physical head is cut off. Maybe you cannot buy or sell things. Maybe you're cut off socially or economically. But those are temporal things. If you do take the mark, it says that you are cut off from God's mercies and God's grace. So temporal versus eternal. Now, these bulls back in chapter 16, so these are the judgments that are coming upon those who took the mark. And these bulls are going to affect every realm of life on earth. Look at verse 3, in chapter 16, verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. And the third, then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and then became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty True and righteous are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings to come from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth, verse 13, of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place in Hebrew, which called Harmageddon. Verse 17, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God, 
because of the plagues of the hail and because its plague was extremely severe. Devastation. Difficulty. First one of these bowls is poured out onto the earth. It's loathsome, malignant sores. They're, they're ugly and painful sores that break out of those who had taken the mark. The second one, it says in verse 3, poured out into the sea. It becomes like a dead man's blood, coagulated. Everything in the sea dies. If you remember the trumpet judgments, it was a third of the living creatures in the sea died. Now everything is dead. And then the third bowl, verse 4, it's the rivers and the fresh waters. They become like blood. Again, in the trumpet judgments, it was a third of the fresh waters that were made bitter, but now all of them are. The fourth bowl poured out on the sun. It's, it's verse 8. It says that it was poured upon the sun. It was given to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, verse 9, it says. Maybe it's a supernova. Maybe it's a solar flare. Maybe the protection of the earth has been removed and radiation hits. The sixth or the fifth bowl, verse 10, is directed to the beast and his throne and his kingdom. And it was it made them gnaw on their own tongues because of the pain. The sixth bowl is directed to the Euphrates River. It says in verse 12 to dry it up, to make a way, uh, prepare a way for the kings from the east. This is going to be inviting the armies from the east. Remember, every time you're looking at the Bible, whenever the Bible talks about a direction, Israel is always the perspective, and Jerusalem is always the center. And so if we're talking about from the east, it's going to be from the east of that location, and it's going to invite these armies. It's going to make a way for these armies to come in to this valley of Megiddo this, and this battle of Armageddon. Verse 17, or sorry, the seventh bowl is verse 17. It's poured out onto the air, and God speaks and says, it's done. It's done. And with his word, the earth is leveled. It is changed. Did you see that? Verse 18, there are flashes of lightning, sounds, peals of thunder, great earthquakes such as has never happened before. Verse 19 says the, the great city, anytime they're talking about the great city, that's Jerusalem. It was split into three parts, and the cities of all the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierce wrath. Every Island. Look at verse 20, fled away. The mountains were not found. It's interesting to think about this. You know, I don't make too big a deal of this, but I was, I was thinking about the, the earth's topography as we know it today was shaped from the flood. We think about the mountains and the valleys and the Grand Canyon and, and maybe even the continental uh, divides that have happened or the, sh you know, the shape of the, the split up of the continents. It, it points to that flood event, which in Genesis 6 talks about as God's judgment. And here it seems to be this, maybe a reversal. And, and maybe it's, you know, the Lord is putting things back the way they were before the flood in preparation for that millennial reign that we read about in Revelation 20. Again, I'm, I can't necessarily say this for sure, but it is interesting to think about and look at the language. But in Revelation 20, we're going to read about that thousand-year period of time where Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth. And the earth as we know it, according to what we've read here, becomes unusable, and it's changed with these bold judgments. The land, the sea, the fresh water, the sun, the air, they're all inhabitable. And so it seems as though the Lord is preparing the earth for this next phase. This judgment comes down, these huge hailstones in verse 21. Could you imagine 100-pound hailstones falling from the heavens? What's the attitude of the people towards God during that time? Three times, it says in this chapter, they blasphemed God and did not repent. In verse 21 right there, it says that they blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because the plague was extremely severe. Verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Verse 9, 
They blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent as to give him glory. It's unrepentive, hard-heartedness towards God. It's actually, we, at the end of the trumpet judgments, turn back to chapter 9. Chapter 9 there's similar language that was used there at the end of that. Chapter 9, verse 20, after those trumpet judgments, it says that the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and idols of gold and silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear, nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immoralities, nor of their thefts. It's a defiant attitude. It's a stubborn attitude. It's a hard-heartedness attitude towards God. And what we're seeing is this is a true rejection of God's sovereignty. And they continue to worship false gods, and they're unwilling to admit that they're of their wrongdoing. Now, what we're reading about here in Revelation is the time of the judgments. I believe that you and I are living in the time of God's patience. The Bible says that, that God is patient. It's his patience that leads you to repentance. And I think now in this time that we live, the here and the now, God has a, a purpose for his patience for all to come to repentance so that they don't have to experience what we're reading here. We read back in chapter 2, actually, Revelation chapter 2, that God even gave Jezebel an opportunity to repent. It says, chapter 2, verse 19, when he was, Jesus was speaking to the church in Thyatira. He says, I know your deeds, chapter 2, verse 19, and your love and your faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Verse 21, I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her in the great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden upon you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. There will be a judgment against those who don't repent. By his grace, though, I believe that God is giving people an opportunity to repent and turn to him. And then the message is to those who have repented, to the Christian, to the church, as it says here, is to hold fast until he comes. Back to, go back to chapter 16. Look what Jesus, Jesus said in verse 15. Chapter 16, verse 15, he says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. Jesus says that he's coming like a thief. The timing is unknown. The timing is not expected. And he says, blessed are those who are alert and ready. Okay. I want you to turn over to 2 Peter. So you're going to go to the left in your Bible. You're going to find 2 Peter, right before the Johns. Chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Know first of all that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? 
forever. Since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Don't you feel that way sometimes? I mean, if you've grown up as a Christian or you've been in the church for any length of time, we have been talking about Jesus is coming. And up until about two months ago, I kind of felt like it might be some far off event. And then all of a sudden, things started just ramping up really fast. Verse 5, for when they maintain this attitude, it escapes at their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water and through which the world at that time was destroyed. Talking about being flooded by with water. But, verse 7, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And so, as we know it and understand it, this earth as we know it is reserved for fire. And we're seeing this in the Revelation passages. But until this judgment, until that judgment is passed, God is demonstrating his patience with a purpose. Look at verse 8. He says, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You know, we view time from a different perspective than God does. God is outside of time. We're stuck in it. And if to the Lord a thousand years is like a day, then Jesus has only been gone for two days. It's not that long. I love this word here that the Lord is not slow about his promise as we might think it, but he has purpose in it, and it's a patience towards though. God is giving, in his patience, he's giving time for people to turn from trusting in themselves and trusting in world systems to trusting into God and his ways. It's a time to repent. Paul writes the same thing as verse 15. Look at uh, verse 15 there, 2 Peter 3.15. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, he wrote to you. This is, he's quoting Paul, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. I have this for the overhead, Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And so it's in this time of patience is God's kindness that he's extending to all the inhabitants of the earth. Repentance, in the original language, it's a two-part word. It's, it's in the original Greek, it's metanoeo. It's, it's the idea of having an afterthought. Meta is after, noeo is thought. And so it's having an afterthought. It's changing your mind. You were going one direction. You had one type of attitude, and you realized that you were going the wrong direction. It was the wrong attitude. So you repented, you changed your mind, and you turned, and you went the other way. That's repentance. And so God is giving an opportunity for people to repent and turn towards him. And I'm so glad that God was patient with me. Aren't you glad that God was patient with you? That you could have an opportunity to repent and turn to him, be forgiven, washed clean. But there will come a day, the Bible is very clear about it, that God's timing will come. And the earth will see what is written about in Revelation. Look at verse 10, 2 Peter 3, 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. And since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be holy in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed with burning and the elements will melt away with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
you know, Peter asks the question, if these things are going to happen in this way, what are we to do about it? What sort of people ought you to be? In Revelation, we read that Jesus said to be awake and to be clothed. This is some of the language that Jesus used in the book of Matthew. Matthew 24, 42, I have that for the overhead. Matthew 24, 42 says, Therefore, Jesus says, be on alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour which you do not think he will. And so it is. But the Christian, waiting for Jesus to come, we are to be alert and we are to be ready. We are to be looking for the signs. This is what Jesus says in Matthew. It's what Paul is instructing in First Thessalonians. It's what Peter is instructing us here. In fact, okay, I want you to see this here. Okay, hold, we're going to come back to Peter. You're getting like three Bible studies in one Sunday here. So I hope you're still hanging in there. Hold your finger in Peter. Go to the left a little bit more to Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5. Right before Timothy, right after Philippians, 1 Thessalonians 5. So we've heard from Jesus. Actually, we've heard from the Apostle John. We've heard from Jesus. We've heard from the Apostle Peter. What does Paul say? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, this idea of like business as usual, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, verse 8, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. You, the Christian, the one that is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you. Jesus tells us in the book of John about the Holy Spirit, John chapter 16. John 16, 13, Jesus says, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own initiative. Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. His spirit gives us understanding of the signs of the times. We're not unaware of God's workings. We have his word. He told us in his word about his kingdom. He told us through his word the signs of his coming. And he says right here in 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, that you, we, are the children of light and are to live in the light. And part of living in the light is to be ready and not being involved in darkness. Peter talked about this uh, holy conduct and godliness as part of your sanctification. As you are saved, you experience salvation, God does this. He begins this work of sanctification in your life. Sanctification has the idea of being set aside for a special purpose. And so God has special plans and purposes through you. And the sanctification comes through that finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Alert has the idea of being on watch. It speaks of readiness. He talks about being sober here. You know, sober has less to do with drinking and more to do with clear thinking with the right focus. Someone who is drunk or someone who is in darkness, obviously they have a distorted view of things. They don't see things clearly. And so if you're asleep or you're, you're unaware, 
of the things that are happening around you. And so all this thing that he, Paul says here, drunkenness, sleeping, darkness, they all point to uh, a distracted, distorted, cloudy view of what God is doing. And in that position of darkness, you might miss out on what's happening right around you. And we might miss the signs of the times. But he says in verse 8, since you, we, are of the day, he says, let us be sober. Put on that breastplate of faith. You think about the idea of what a breastplate does. It protects vital organs. He says breastplate of faith and love. Faith and love protect you. God's faith, God's love protects you. He says, put on that helmet, the hope of salvation. It protects your thoughts. So you kind of have this idea of emotions and thoughts. And it points to us of having an act of faith, where if the drunkenness and sleeping are passive, soberness and putting on God's armor is active. And so I believe our spiritual lives should be alive and awake. I believe that our relationship with the Lord should be vibrant. We should have an awareness of, of God's presence, an awareness of, of God's kingdom, and be involved in his kingdom, involved in the things that, of his kingdom here on earth waiting for his return. And we do this with this attitude of alertness. Now, go back to 2 Peter. Peter says three times he points to the idea of looking. So he talked about in verse 11, what sort of people ought you to be, this holy conduct and godliness. And in verse 12, he says, looking, looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of the Lord. And then again in verse 13, according to his promise, we are looking for the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. And then verse 14, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless. And so to answer the question, what sort of people ought you to be? You're to be living for him and looking for him. You're looking for his coming. You're looking for the new heavens, the new earth. And, you know, I was thinking about you know, Christmas coming up soon. And no doubt, maybe you started your, your shopping. And probably most of you did your shopping online, or you're going to do your shopping online. And what happens when you order a specific gift and you're excited about it for it to come in time for Christmas? You track the package right? You're looking for it. You're anticipating it. You're, you, UPS or Amazon drives to the driveway. Oh, maybe this is it. This is a sign of the times right here. <laughs> Let's be doing that with the Lord. This, this term, look, it, it has the idea to watch with expectation. So we're looking at the events of the world. We're looking at the things of the world with a biblical worldview. And we're watching with expectation for God to complete his work. He says in verse 14, this is an important thing here. He said, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. To be found... In him, spotless and blameless, only one way. There's only one way that you are spotless and blameless, and it's through the blood of Jesus. It's to be clothed, it's to be robed in his righteousness. Isaiah talks about this. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. What did Jesus say in Revelation 16? He said, blessed are those who are awake and keep their clothes on. Do you think he's talking about our physical clothes? He's talking about being clothed with him, robed in his righteousness. The Bible tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to put him on. We are to be clothed by him. And when we are clothed by him, we are not vulnerable. 
And so Peter says here to be diligent about this. Diligence is characterized by being steady, earnest, energetic, uh, putting forth effort. It's the idea of making a careful, persistent effort to be found in him, spotless, blameless. So be alert, be ready, and be looking. Jesus is coming. Lord God, we thank you for the promises of your word. We thank you that we have the hope of heaven through your blood. And Lord, that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So we give you the praise for this. God, continue to give us understanding as we study these things, as we think about these things, as we, Lord, as we view the, the current world events. God, would you give us a, by your spirit, would you give us understanding and a biblical worldview to know that you're on the throne, you're in control, and you are faithful to finish what you started. Thank you for this time of patience. Lord, thank you for your kindness that leads us to repentance. May we be a light in this season. And may people repent and turn to you. We ask for your will to be done, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.